Hello, everyone, and we're live. Uh, welcome to our virtual presentation of LA Weather with author Maria Amparo Escandon and moderator Alex Espinoza. Um, this is actually Maria's first virtual event, so please give her Yay. a warm welcome. Um, we have signed book plates available for uh, <laughs> those who purchase a copy of LA Weather tonight. Uh, to request one with your purchase, just please write signed book plate in the order comments when you're checking out your cart online. Uh, you can also access our website by clicking on the green purchase <laughs> button directly below the viewer screen. And we'll also be doing an audience Q&A towards the end of the event. So please send us your questions by using the ask a question button at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, you can also vote for any questions you'd like and the more popular questions will make their way to the top of the list. Okay, so let me introduce our guests and then we can get started. So Maria Amporo Escandon is the author of the number one LA Times bestseller, Esperanza's Box of Saints. Uh, she has been named Writer to Watch by Newsweek Magazine and by the Los Angeles Times. Uh, she founded The Other Truth Productions, a content production company where she has a pipeline of film and television projects in various stages of development. Uh, she wrote the screenplay Santitos based on her novel and has received awards in 14 international film festivals, such as the Latin Cinema Award at the Sundance Film Festival. And joining Maria tonight is our moderator, Alex Espinoza, uh, the author of the novel Still Water Saints. He is the recipient of the Margaret Bridgman Fellowship in Fiction at the Breadloaf Writers Conference and is currently an associate professor of English at Cal State, oh. Cal State Fresno. All right. So with that said, uh, Alex, I'll let you take things away. Enjoy the talk, uh everyone. All right, thank you, Rira. I, 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 I have to. I just wanted to correct that really quick. I'm no longer. I'm a, actually an associate professor uh, in creative writing at UC Riverside, my alma mater. Oh. And and um, it's funny that that sort of um, I, you know, I can I can sort of mention that because I remember when I was an undergraduate at UC Riverside in in 1998 or 99 when I first read uh, Esperanza's Box of Saints. Uh, given to me by a friend of, of mine years ago. Uh, and I kept that book um, on my bookshelf for many, many, many years. So it's an it's an honor and I'm so tickled to be here uh, having this opportunity to speak with you, uh, Maria. And um, congratulations on the publication of LA Weather. Um, how are you doing today? Good? Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Rira, for uh, organizing this fantastic event at Romance. And thank you, Romance, for uh, for being the host of uh, this fantastic event. And uh, thank you to all our audience. Uh, welcome, and I hope uh, we're going to have a good time. So in answer to your question, Alex, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous at all. I know this is our new sort of reality, right? That we're sort yeah, of entering. Exactly. But, but yeah. as I told you when we had lunch a couple of weeks ago, let's just sort of imagine that it's the two of us sitting around the table just chatting um, about about writing, about books, about you know your your wonderful new novel. Um, I have some questions for you, and um, you know I let's just get into it and let's talk. And I'm sure the audience out there is going to have questions for us at the end. Um, I want to first start out like because I mentioned early on, you know, uh, having read Esperanza's Box of Saints and and just being so moved by 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 that novel um, years ago. And I, I I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you got your start as a writer. Um, if you could sort of walk us through the genesis of your experiences when you first started writing. What was that like? Um, well, I, I really started very young. Uh, I was in second grade and uh, I told the terrible lie and uh, the consequence was that uh, somebody got fired. My, my, uh, uh, my grandmother realized that, you know, I had a lot of imagination and she gave me a notebook and said, look, you know, write all your lies here because, you know, uh, <laughs> turn, turn them into stories because that way they're harmless, you know? Uh, and so I wrote and wrote and wrote and flunk second grade, of course. And um, a couple years later, 
my um, eh, Santa Claus. Uh, <laughs> I was nine, and Santa Claus brought me a typewriter. And <laughs> what kid gets a typewriter for Christmas? Right? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, maybe Santa Claus was trying to tell me something. But uh, in any case, I just loved to, you know, tell stories with my writing. And, you know, it's just um, I've been writing ever since, really, just little stories. But I never really got published until I was 16 mm. in a, a literary journal in Mexico. I joined a writing group. Um, in Mexico, I was the mascot because everybody were everybody was adult and I was 16, and, and that's how they treated me as a mascot. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I I was able to you know learn a lot and I kept writing in Spanish, getting stories published, and then when I moved to the states, um, I I uh, I joined a, a writing workshop at UCLA to really work on my English and my and writing in English, because I had only written in Spanish. And uh, finally got a little story published and so on. You know, it just, uh, now I, you know, write directly in English since the first novel. Mm. And what was what was that experience like? Because as you said, you started writing in Spanish and then sort of moved here to the US and then sort of had to kind of learn the techniques, I guess, of writing in English. Can you talk a little bit about what that transition was like for you? Was it difficult or? You know, what, how, did it change your writing at all? It does. It, it is very different. Um, Spanish is a lot wordier, you know, as, as a language. Um, you know, if you do a translation from English to Spanish, you, you have 100 pages. When you're done with the Spanish, you have 130 pages. It's, it's, it's longer. The words are longer. The, the, the sentences are longer. The structure is, is, is a little different. And so, you know, when, uh, so even that, um, had, and even with that, I had to change how I phrased, how I worded my sentences, you know, it was, uh, mm. it was the transition. It was very interesting. And, and of course, my English was not good. And I had to really, you know, work when I wrote Esperanza's Box of Saints. I had to work with the dictionary right next to me. And, oh, boy, did I use that dictionary. Wow. That's that's really interesting because, I, you know, when 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 reading the prose of, of that book, like it's it's flawless. It doesn't it doesn't feel as if it's, you know labored in any way. And I think that's what really makes your ability as a writer to be able to construct um, not just wonderful sentences, but images um, in ways that I think resonate um, either English and Sp or Spanish. So I think that's amazing. It's an amazing gift that you have to be able to sort of translate from one to the other. I can't do it in the, uh, the other way around. If I were to do something from English to Spanish, I would have such a hard time. Um, you know, I've tried and it's just so difficult for me. So I really admire people that can that can sort of negotiate the two languages in such an artful and skillful way. Um, it, so it's this is amazing that that you ex that you had that experience. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration for this new book, L.A. Weather? Uh, what was the genesis or the kind of initial idea? I read it and and again, just fell in love with with, with not just the language, but the humor. I think there's a lot of humor and heart in your characters. Tell us a little bit about the inspiration for it. Okay, well, um, it really started when I was living in New York in uh, 2015. Uh, I kept hearing uh, New Yorkers and East Coasters uh, tell me, uh, what are you doing here, LA? You know, the weather's great. I mean, we were in the middle of a you know, snowstorm or whatever. And uh, and they said, you should, you know, LA, there's no weather in LA, you know? And and, and I would say, what do you mean? There's no weather in LA, you've, you've never been or? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I thought, you know, there's so much weather in LA, but it's not, it's not as, per as it is perceived you know, in other places where you have very marked seasons, you know, the snow and the, you know, turning of the leaves, that kind of thing. 
but at the same time, we have very, very um, uh, harsh and dangerous weather events, whether it's a, a you know fire or uh, the drought itself is 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 how is weather affecting us. Um, you know, for some people, a Santana wind, you know, is probably a bad hair day. For other people, you know, a, a tree falls on, on top of their house, you know, and it, it's the same wind, you know, it yeah. just affects differently to everybody. So I decided, you know, okay, I'm going to prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're telling me there's no weather in LA? Wait a minute. And so I thought, okay, I'll write a, a novel about the weather, but it's not just a meteorological novel. It's really in the background. The forefront is a family story. It's the story of a Latino family living in Los Angeles. And that is really the, the story itself, the, the, the main plot. And of course, they are affected, deeply affected by the weather, but it's, it's how they react to it, how they live their, their, their crisis um in this year because uh i chose to to do a year in the life so basically every chapter is a month we start in january february march and all the weather events that i put in the in the novel are actual weather events that i research if if it was 90 degrees that day i put it on the on, in the book if there was a fire the fire is reported if there is a, a full moon the full moon is there you know so i did that um in regards to the weather okay yeah and so so what what is your favorite la weather if you were to, to pick one i love the jacaranda season okay so you're talking about june right Yes, when all yeah. the, you know, all the jacarandas, you know, they, they, they get purple, 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 and then they lose their flowers, and then it's just blankets of purple you see everywhere on the streets. It's just beautiful. Yeah. I love, I love that season. Yes. Yeah, I think that the thing that's so unique about jacarandas too in LA is, is that um, you don't notice them. They just look like average trees. Right. And then it isn't until that moment in late May, early June, then they start to bloom that you realize, oh my God, like there's this giant purple thing in front of me, right? Like my neighbors, <laughs> they have one across the street, but right now it just looks like a normal tree. Yeah. But the minute June hits, it's like this explosion of color and a color that's so, that's so um, uh, unique that doesn't seem like it, it, um, happens in nature right it actually mm -hmm. does it seems almost like it like alien right yeah um i think yeah i agree with you i'm particular to um actually the santa ana winds i know that they you know that they bring with them usually sort of dry um uh, sort of you know uh, unpredictable um uh, uh um uh patterns you know and can start mm -hmm. fires i i find myself really um attracted to that uh sort of the the spark of of um the way the wind carries i think during yeah. the santa Ana winds yeah. um that i think makes it kind of uh, a kind of volatile time to be sort of you know living in los angeles you know i'm going to have the windows open and everything and just sort of let it all kind of blow and, and get crazy um <laughs> that's just me i like kind of like living mm -hmm. on the edge i don't know i don't know um, you've written two other novels, as I mentioned, Esperanza's Box of Saints and Gonzalez and Daughter Trucking Company. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the particular challenges that Ali Weather presented uh, that you, um, that other, that these other books didn't, um, you know, present? Was, were there things about writing Ali Weather that mm -hmm. uh, you learned as, you know, uh, you learned about yourself as a writer? like? Talk to me about the, the sort of the challenges and, and, and the things that you experienced in writing this book that were very different than the previous ones. Okay, yeah. Well, the, the first novel was very difficult because I wasn't too proficient in the English language and, and I did get a lot of help from Betsy, my agent. I mean, she, she 
I mean, it even went down to her explaining me when to use in, when to use on. Uh, I mean, it was that bad. <laughs> but I got through it. You got uh, through it. I got through it. The the second uh, novel, um, the first novel, it was it was a hit in LA. It was in the LA Times uh, bestseller. There was a movie uh, based on it that I wrote the screenplay. So it was a whole experience uh, like you know uh, uh, I did a, a huge book tour um, 21 cities in 25 wow. days uh, so it was it was a big it was big launch and then the second book um, there was no movie even though I have the screenplay somewhere there yeah it's available it's available <laughs> and <laughs> If anybody's watching, right? Yeah. If anybody's watching, you know. But anyway, so it was a very different experience in that respect that there was no movie attached to it or any any of that. Um, uh, but I had I had the whole expectation that there wasn't any in the first book, you know. So I was uh, paralyzed at some point by, oh my God, I'm gonna have to, you know. I'll do myself. I'm gonna have to do a, a, write a better book than the previous one, and that kind of stress really paralyzed me for a while. Yeah. So it took me a while to get to the second book. The third book, uh, I took a long time to um, to get to writing it. I had all kinds of uh, you know uh, problems. Uh, that's why, it, you know, it's funny when somebody says, you know, oh, it's impossible that so many things can happen in L.A. weather. It's just too much in one year, too, too much stuff going on, too many, too many uh, crises and accidents and things. And I haven't you ever had a year that is so momentous that, you know, when you're sitting at the table in New Year's Eve, you go, Thank God, good readers. This year was awful. Get, get, yeah, there, there was this, and the grandma died, and this happened, and lost my dog. I mean, so many things that can happen in a year, and some some years are more intense than others. That's for mm -hmm. sure. And this year, which is 2016 in the novel, was, I think, the a very momentous year for the characters, for the Alvarado family. Um, so it was it I sort of included things and that inspired me of all the years that I didn't write because I was uh, getting through a lot of a lot of issues in my life. So I was able to write finally mm -hmm. in, was in New York. I started the novel there and then when we moved to, to LA, I finished it here. Wow. So yeah, was it, it? It sounds like it was. It was kind of tricky, sort of navigating all of those crises, right? Um, yeah. Not just your crises, your personal crises, but the crises in the book also. Um, that crisis. kind of happened. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, if, in the book, crisis in real life. Uh, you know, I mean, and then of course, the pandemic hit, right? So, no book tour, no, um, no book signings. No, nothing like that. It's all virtual. So it's very different yeah, yeah. from the previous books. Yeah. So talk, talk I mean, talk about a, a, a crazy year, right? I mean, it seems, it seems kind of strange oftentimes that, that, yeah, we get those sort of, um, you know, those, um, those comments about like, well, you know, this is, doesn't seem realistic that it would happen, you know, that all this stuff would happen. And then now we can all point to 2020 and say, um, hello, like, look at yeah. what we just went through, right? So it seems kind of, exactly. you know, life does imitate art in a lot of ways. And, and I think oftentimes, you know, we have this tendency to think that um, it, it really doesn't when we're writing books or, or when somebody reads something that we wrote and say, well, that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem, you know, like it can happen. Um, it actually can. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you would be willing to read us a section. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, all yes, right. actually, I do have, um, this is my copy, and a whole bunch of uh, sections that I that I marked that, of course, I'm not going to read all of them, uh, <laughs> but I will, I will read you one, and um, it's about 
a page and a half uh, and it's uh, let me turn the light on uh, sorry um it's it's about patricia patricia is the youngest sister uh, of the alvarado family the youngest daughter and here is a scene uh, kind of at the you know it's on page 34 in case you have the book and you want to follow it's at the at the bottom so here we go after she dropped off her sisters and called her office to request a flex day off work patricia drove to eagle rock in topanga she'd hiked the mosh trail many times before and knew she'd have a decent phone signal in case oscar tried to reach her that was the birthday wish she wanted to spend this perfect 72 degree day by herself, walking among chaparral and sagebrush, admiring the Santa Monica mountains in the distance and thinking hard about the state of things among the Alvarados. As her legs negotiated the uneven and sometimes dodgy climb along the dirt paths, her mind kept going back to a single question. How had her family become so disconnected she remembered the days when everyone knew where everybody else was, what everybody else was doing. Every year, color-coded calendars were posted on the fridge and were updated daily by all involved. A tin can with markers sat on the countertop, yellow for Oscar, green for Kayla, blue for Claudia, pink for Olivia, and red for Patricia, orange for Daniel, and black for family events. It was all there. Daniel's chess club and swimming competitions, Kayla's mammograms and gallery openings, Patricia's parties and weekend trips, Oscar's multiple errands around town, Olivia's school presentation, Claudia's marathons, birthday parties, quinceañeras, bat mitzvahs, weddings, holidays, vacations, everything was shared. A rhythm, the way the Alvarados moved along the hours and days and weeks of those calendars year after year had served as a thread of sorts and that tied her family together but the, by the time her older sisters had gone to college in new york and miami and had gotten married and moved to, to their respective homes something was broken the calendar had ceased to exist years ago the markers still in the tin can had dried up and were now relegated to the top shelf with the sous vide cooker, the ice cream maker, and the creme brulee set still in its box. Aging undisturbed. It seemed to her that each member of her family was a top spinning on a surface by itself, unencumbered by what the other tops were doing or where they were going. What surprised her the most was the fact that they still met for Sunday family dinners, rain or shine, with or without husbands, with or without the twins. But people sitting at a table don't make a family. Monologues don't make a conversation. Even the most delicious meal meticulously prepared by Kayla didn't inspire anymore. And in the past year, she'd watched her father descend into apathy. She didn't rule out depression, but she was more inclined to believe something was bothering him. Had he done enough to figure out what it was? She thought not, and this upset her. She wished she could pry open his mind and extract his pain, his worry. Or was this the deterioration part of the process of aging? She wondered if all families went through this emotional separation as the children grew up and the parents got older. Perhaps she had a heightened sensitivity to what was going on because she lived with Oscar and Kayla and could see the day-to-day -day decline in their care and affection for each other. Why did she live at home anyway? Was she hoping to hang on to the thread of days and weeks that connected her and her parents and sisters in the family calendar? She decided to ask her loyal Twitter tribe, <clears throat> <laughs> am I suffering a bad case of millennialism or am I justified to be comfortably living at my parents' house at 28? Share your thoughts. She posted her tweet, but deleted it almost immediately, suddenly feeling ashamed of herself at the thought that she might be closer to people she'd never met than to her own blood. <laughs> Yay, thank you there so you go. much. That, that's Bravo. A
that's a Patricia passage. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for indulging us. That was great. I love the description of the family spinning like tops. Um, such beautiful language and such rich imagery. Um, and, and you capture this, um, the sort of the, the dynamics of the family so well, each, each one so different and, and um, you know, so um, uh, entwined with each other, despite some of the tensions that sort of are played through. I'm trying not to give too much of the book away in my, in my sort of um, uh, talking about it. Um, because I don't want to spoil anything. Um, in 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 reading Ellie Weather, um, I know what I sort of as a reader came away understanding. Um, what do you hope readers come away learning through the experiences of the Alvarado family? Well, um, you know there are a lot of troves. You know people have certain ideas that are preconceived, you know, like there's no weather in LA, you know, that's that's a preconceived idea that people just think, but they don't, they don't really, you know, look into it, you know. Uh, and there's also another one about Latinos. I think that, um, you know, for other, for other ethnicities, a Latino is a Latino, you know, and, um, and this novel is about Latinos, but it's not a Latino is a Latino. These Latinos are half Jewish, half Catholic, um, a, you know, um, because the, the ancestors came from, from Poland during the Holocaust. I mean, there's, it's, it's, a, it's, but they are Latinos because they are Mexican. And so, um, we have Oscar, who is the father. He's Mexican, but his family lived in California before it belonged to the U.S. So he's been in California as a, a, a Mexican-American since 100 years or more. And uh, Kayla, who is the mother and the wife, uh, she's a first-generation Latina. She's a woman who is Jewish. Uh, born in Mexico City, who meets Oscar uh, during a student exchange program. So they marry young and they have the three daughters. The three daughters are second generation uh, Mexican Americans. Um, they are born in the US, but they're bilingual and they love their chilaquiles, you know, and they have, uh, you know, they're very close to the Mexican culture through their mother and their father. And so on, you know, we have, uh, we have some uh, farm workers, Los Tres Primos, who are uh -huh. characters also in the Almond uh, farm. And, and there's Lola. And then there's Lola, who is uh, the twins uh, nanny, who have been nanny of the three, the three sisters. So, you know, she's been around. She's a super pro nanny, and uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, di just different kinds of uh, Latinos, um, because that is who we are. We we are we are diverse, and we have different backgrounds. We come from different countries. Um, so, I, I just wanted to to share like a little slice of um, of what it is to be a Mexican-American, kind of like me, kind of like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, like who I am, you know, in a way. Yeah. And so um, that's what I wrote. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's- What do and, you think I, about that? I agree with you, you know, I think, I think one of the things that I've always liked about, about your writing is, is the way in which you you take characters who are not um you know oftentimes sort of the the their their characters that exist in latino identity but oftentimes are so complicated and so complex that um they don't get their fair share a lot of times i think oftentimes we in in um you know that that there are certain um uh specific tropes that get repeated uh, about us in 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 areas of publishing in the media, you know, we're we're all you know, um, you know, 
immigrants who just crossed the border, you know, we're crossing illegally, we're, you know, we're day laborers and farm workers, we're downtrodden and poor, we're, you know, um, and and there certainly are those individuals, right, in our in our communities. Um, but we're not all like that. You know, we're not all, um, you know, there are a lot more, we're, there's a, there are layers to us, layers to our experiences. And, and I think it's important that, that there's literature out there like yours that really captures that, right? So that we can say, you know, the Alvarados, yeah, they're Mexican, Mexican-American and Mexican and they're Latinos and they're all of these things. And, and, and they negotiate the world just like anybody else. But that's, that's a <clears throat> Latino story, just like any other Latino story. And it should have its, its ability to stay as valid as, as any other one. I think oftentimes we do see those tropes get repeated. Um, and, and it can be frustrating for us, um, you know, to, 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 to not want to be able to say, well, I, you know, I never crossed the border that way. You know, I never, you know, I didn't have that experience. I wasn't in a gang. <laughs> you know, I just, I didn't do that. So, so if I didn't experience that, what am I supposed to write? You know, um, so I think yeah. it's great that, that you prove that there is, that there is a need for the stories like this one, right? Yes, yes, and we, we just have to, you know, we just have to write about what we know, what we experience, and not fall into the, you know, the cliche of, you know, what is a Latino supposed to look like, what's a Latino supposed to, to live like or be like, you know, we can be different, and that's the beauty of it, you know, I mean, we're millions and millions in this country, of course, there has to be a diversity, and uh, all all walks of life, just like just like any other ethnicity or culture. Right, just like in the U.S. Right, there's there isn't one typical American story. Right, there are mm -hmm. you know people who live in West Virginia who are you know coal miners and you know um, poor, and and then there's people that live in Beverly Hills who are rich, and so it's it's a it's a it's a completely different spectrum. Right, and I think oftentimes. Yeah, the stories that get repeated about us are 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 ones that we, you know we see um, oftentimes, you know, and, and and feel like we have to um, ascribe to those. When in reality, our experiences are vast and, and complex. Have you ever gotten any pushback from anyone who's read your work and said, "Well, this isn't like these people don't sound like Latinos, or these these experiences don't seem like Latino experiences." Actually, no. I mean, not yet. The book just came out, so I don't know. That's good. If I am going to have to, you know, listen to somebody say anything, uh, you know, negative about that. But uh, um, I embrace diversity. I think it's great that uh, we're all so different, you know, and and it makes it fun. I mean, I have friends from all walks of life. Uh, and and I think that's what makes our society and our, our culture so interesting and dynamic. Yeah, yeah. And and so you know what you know, just sort of kind of piggybacking off of this um, this conversation, <clears throat> this point in our talk. Um, since the publication of your first book, what do you think has changed for uh, Latina and Latino writers? Um, you know, from the time that Esperanza's Box of Saints was published until now, like, what have you seen um, changing, either for the good or, or not good? I think it's for the good. I think it's for the wonderful, because uh, there are a lot more voices out there. Um, I have, uh, you know, for, for a while, uh, I have been um, a mentor at the, at the Emerging Voices program at the Penn Center. And they support young Latino writers or young writers from from different minorities. Uh, but uh, I've usually been paired up with Latinos, uh, and it's great to see that there's so much enthusiasm, you know, uh, for young people to um, you know to write and to write about their experience. I think that's amazing. I think publishers are also. Um, you know, getting really smart about it, and that's great. You know, we're gonna be seeing a lot more uh, representation, I think. Um, 
I mean, it's been a process and it's much better than it was and it will be much better than it is. I am sure of that, which is, you know, I, I find that, uh, you know, it's not a switch. It's it's a process and it's it's helping and it's it's working. Yeah. What what advice would you give to a young um, Latina writer who wants to, you know, start writing her own story? What would you start say? Start writing. Her? Start writing. <laughs> start writing you know um i i teach a class at ucla uh, ucla extension and uh, i always when when i start the class i always say uh, raise your hand if you're an aspiring writer and everybody raises their hand <laughs> what have you written and everybody's like oh i'm working on a novel i'm working on a collection of short stories i'm writing poetry and i say well then you're not aspiring you're already writing an aspiring writer is somebody who's like, oh, oh, I would love to write. No, you're already doing it, you know? So 10,000 hours of writing, that's that's the really where the breaking point is when you can really yeah. feel confident about your writing. So yeah. log in those hours, that's it, you know? It doesn't matter how you do it, you know? If you write longhand or in the computer, if you write, you know, um, home in your desk in the mornings three hours five hours two hours every week it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it's just no right yeah just right okay and um, and what are some oh yeah go ahead what i don't mean time you can write at the grocery store you can write while you walk your dog you can write while you're driving you know because thinking about your writing is writing when you're thinking about your characters and you're thinking about okay so how do i take this plot what do i do with it you know you're thinking about it actual typing that's that's just the download of the of the software you know? <laughs> but it's in your head the right most of the writing happens in your head yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I agree. I agree with you 100%. Don't punish yourselves because you only sat at the computer two hours in, in the whole week. It's, it's <laughs> if you really were thinking every day about your work, yeah. that's good. You're writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we, we, we don't, we don't put enough, um, uh, um, I want to say emphasis, but we don't, we don't talk too much in, in our writing circles about the importance of revision, right? How oftentimes that's where the real heavy lifting is, right? It's not, you know, it's not when you've gotten the words down, it's when you go back and when you look at what you've written and you're like, oh my God, what did I, <laughs> how am I gonna fix this, right? That's where the real like labor, Yes. Is. don't you yes. agree? Where the labor, like that's where it really comes. Totally agree. I always say that I write with both ends of the pencil. You know, because, uh, you know, you write something and then you erase and you write and you erase and you write and you erase, you know, and I think that's that's part of the process. Uh, the thing is, a lot of people have have told me that they get stuck uh, when they're um, when they're starting to edit because they're still writing. So, you know, um, it's just lay out, lay it down and put it down without judgment and when you're done then come back and edit because it's two different processes of the right brain and the left brain writing is creative and editing is analytic so yeah. <clears throat> so you cannot do that at the same time it it, it really creates a you know electroshock you, you mm -hmm. kind of have to give it its own time to each each part of the process yeah exactly no you're you're i think you're absolutely right there it's um the editing process is very and i i, I kind of see it as layering also right it's like mm -hmm. you're adding you know layers of complexity onto something that you sort of you you laid down kind of simply and then you're suddenly mm -hmm. sort of adding contours to it right like adding you know uh <clears throat> cracks and and mountains to it and valleys and but but it starts off as kind of flat right and then you start yeah. sort of building on it um, yeah. and, and each time you revise it, each time you tweak it, that world becomes more like fully realized. It becomes more mm -hmm. fleshed out and the characters become so real that, 
um, during that in that moment, you can't sort of you can't step away from them, right? Yeah, uh, you can't step away from you know. Uh, have you had moments like that where it's just like you just feel like te- despite the fact that you're so tired and you don't want to you don't want to write anymore or revise anymore that you just feel like no, but I have to do this. Um, yeah, you know I that always, compulsion. Say, I'm gonna forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. and that's my fear that if I don't, if I don't write it down or at least jot it down, you know, just the idea, jot it down real quick. Don't, don't you know, uh, just so that I don't forget it because sometimes I go to sleep and in the morning I go, what? 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 I, I had a brilliant idea. What happened? <laughs> what happened to it? Yeah. What happened to yeah. it? So, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's this real, like, it's, like you said at the beginning, you know, when we we're talking before, this idea of like we're always sort of in our little um, hovels here, like as writers, like kind of writing and and just sort of you do kind of get almost obsessed, right, with your characters and with the situations that you put them in. That it's so hard to untether yourself from them sometimes. So yes. when people always, yeah, people always ask me that, and they're like, "So how did you know this? Do you ever find it hard? Do you ever?" And, and it is, it's when you're in that moment where it's like, well, how could you not, right? Like you can't, yeah. you can't not do it, right? It, you, right. You, feel, you feel bad if you go grocery shopping. <laughs> I mean, I remember recently feeling like, oh, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't, I don't even want to get up and go, you know, buy groceries right now because I need to get this done first. And, and that's the, and that's the compulsion that I think a lot of yes. times as exactly. writers, you, you, sh- we share with each other, and 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 it isn't until you're in that moment that you realize what a special and magical thing it is that we that we get to sort of do. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, now, but if you do have to go to the grocery store, you know, as you are pushing your little cart down the aisles, you start thinking, what would my you start thinking about your characters now? What would they eat? What kind of food are they? Do they like? And then you know. Uh, study the flavors and the different things, you know, and um, it helps because it it round it gives roundness to your characters, you know. Yeah. Just put yeah. them in situations that you yourself live day by day. Absolutely. Well, I think I think now we should turn probably to some questions from the audience, and uh, I think yeah. Rira is probably going to join us. <laughs> Yeah, I'm here. My my voice is here. Uh, okay, so if you have okay, any questions well, uh, for Maria, just I see uh, there are uh, I think four questions, but yes. I don't know which ones they are. Um, it's okay. I will read them out loud. So um, okay, for well, we our can, we can for wait, our audience we can, members, uh, talk a uh, little more and wait for Rira to come up with the questions. Okay. Yeah, she's gonna. Rira's gonna read the questions. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the question. There you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just had my I just had my camera off, but um, mm-hmm. if you prefer my face to be on here, yeah, I can I can do that. Yeah, All right. Well. <laughs> so for those of you who are tuning in and would like to submit questions, just use the ask a question button at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, the first question that we have is: Some paragraphs in your book are full of surprises and humor. Do these appear in the first draft, or do they take many rewrites? And I know you guys talked about rewriting, but mm-hmm. um, are there are, are there certain parts in in writing that is much easier to do in editing? Well, uh, some of them, uh, you know, appear in the first draft, and then as as I do more drafts, you know, I fill in or I add or I move things around, you know, everything is very fluid, you know, as long as I'm working on a, on a Word document, which is what I use to write, <laughs> things can move around and I can delete and I can add. Uh, so it really, uh, you know, if my first draft is um, 200 pages, right? Uh, double spaced. In my second draft, maybe 240 pages. You know, I just add stuff, uh, add more more scenes, or add more um, elements or more details. Definitely, it grows as you go. Never fall in love with your first draft. It's very poor. You have to really work on more draft. <laughs> 
All right. So next question is, um, how did you come up with the title LA Weather? Did you have any alternative titles? I had an early, early title that I, you know, got rid of because I just didn't like it uh, in the end. But it was sort of a working title during the first draft. I was gonna, I was calling it back then Forensics of the Heart, which. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't liking it. Imagine other people. So I changed it to LA Weather, which I find a little more intriguing. I think, uh, you know, it's very interesting to hear how authors come up with their titles, whether uh, they stuck with the original or if their editor said, no, change that. <laughs> yeah, but here it wasn't the editor. It was me who didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next question. Uh, was there a character you related to the most? Uh, well, you know, usually when I, when I build a character, uh, it's basically composites of people I know. You know, some of them are m my relatives, my cousins, uh, myself. There's always a bit of myself. Um, is some of it is made up, uh, but I, I relate to most of them because there is a little bit of me in, in all of them. Uh, I loved writing Oscar. He reminded me of my dad. Uh, my dad was my, my dad it was my favorite weather person. He, he would call me from Mexico. He would call me up. He was in Mexico and I was in LA and he would call me up and say, if you're going out, take an umbrella, it's going to rain. But <laughs> so, he was really, really into the weather. <laughs> and so I really connected with, with Oscar. And um, Kayla, you know, she has a little bit of my mom. Um, also, the, the three sisters, you know, I think I have, I have, you know, different uh, traits that are uh, very characteristic of the three sisters. Yeah. Okay, so next question is, does your writing style differ when you're writing in Spanish as opposed to English? Do certain descriptions come more easily in one language over the other? And I know you guys talked about this early on, but if you have anything else to add to, to that question. Yeah, it's just English is so economical. It's great. It's it's like perfect for, you know, writing emails or text, you know, it's very to the point, it's very clear. Uh, you know, it's it's I love it. It's fantastic. It's a wonderful language. Um Spanish is a little more romantic. Uh you know, it, in English you say yes and in Spanish you go round and round and round and round and <laughs> you say yes, you know. Uh, so <laughs> it's it's longer, it's structured differently, uh, it just takes more words to say the same thing, uh, and and I find that fascinating. I love it. I I am uh, uh, trained in in linguistics and semiotics, and so I'm a mm. perpetual student of language, and and I just adore, you know, seeing all the differences, and it's really fantastic. Uh, how about you, Alex? Do you have anything uh, to add to that? You know what? I, I mean, I, I agree completely with Maria. I think that um, it's um, just, uh, you know, because I speak Spanish uh, and and there are moments when I think, oh, I can write in Spanish. And then I try writing in Spanish and it just doesn't, it just falls apart. Um, and I think it, it falls apart because because I haven't really built the muscle to be able to have the patience that the language requires of one uh, to both speak and and to write it in the way that I think English, um, you know, English allows that sort of that brevity, right? Uh, and it, you know, when I when I travel to Mexico, it always takes me a, a couple of days to be able to really sort of start to speak it uh you know fluently in a way that doesn't embarrass me <laughs> doesn't embarrass <laughs> the person who i'm speaking to right uh so so it does always take me a while to be able to um you know kind of refamiliarize myself with it 
And um, I, I've always had a very complicated relationship with Spanish growing up because so many of us grew up um, being told on the one hand, you know, that we should forget it in our education, right? Uh, in our schooling. And then our parents at home telling us, don't forget it. So we have this really sort of really schizophrenic relationship with it that um, I think to this day, I still, I still carry and it's hard to undo sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I would tell my kids, uh, my kids are bilingual. And um, as my friend Agustin used to say, um, English is the language of the, of the mind and Spanish is the language of the heart. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking business uh, at the workplace and, you know, it's just your English. And when you're with family or friends, you know, and you're talking about personal things, you know, use your Spanish uh, or Spanish. Think, think Spanish, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it could be schizophrenic. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure like with idioms, for example, there are, there are like Spanish idioms that don't translate exactly into English. And you're just like, well, like, how do I like, how yeah. do I translate this? There's no e English equivalent to it. So I'm guessing right. that, yeah, that, that can be a little bit tricky, too. Um, so we're almost out of time and I'm going to end it with this question. How do you get out of the writing zone when you need to get other tasks done? So I know that for a lot of writers, uh, it's hard to get into writing mode, sit down in front of your computer and write. But once you're in the zone, it, it can be hard to stop. So how do you get out of that? I am very, uh, I'm very distracted. So anything that's happening in the periphery, uh, can really, you know, derail my my writing. You know, I'm, I, if I were a dog, I'd be going squirrel. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so on the contrary, I have to really focus to to be able to to stay in the zone. For me, it's easy to get off the zone. It's getting into the zone that is that is hard. Yeah, they, I mean, and I I have so many interests. You know that you know, architecture and construction and uh, photography and other things that really, that really keep me interested. So I have to, you know, really zone in and, and, and try not to have any distractions to be right, be able to write. Uh, how about you, Alex? Do you have trouble getting in the zone or getting out of the writing zone? I have trouble both with both <laughs> getting into it and getting out of it when I'm in it. And it's just, it's just, I'm a big mess, you know, but, but I do, I do agree with Maria. It's like, I, I also have the, you know, I have the attention span of a chihuahua and, you know, I'm always just like, that's, that's why this past year was kind of challenging for me. A lot of my friends who are writers were saying, oh, this is so great. I get to stay home. And, not do anything else but write and I was going crazy. It was really going crazy because I do need the, the distraction of of life sometimes to um, inspire me and move me. Um, but then when I'm in um, that sort of, that swimming in that world of my fiction, um, it is very difficult to sort of pull yourself away from it and to remind yourself that you do have to live in the world. Um, I I just know that if, I sometimes distance is good. Uh, sometimes stepping away and letting something simmer on the pot for a little bit is, is good. And then, you know, coming back to it with a fresh pair of eyes is good. So even though um, my impulse might tell me, don't, you know, don't, don't look away right now and focus. Uh, there's another side of me that says, no, I think it might be good to pull away because you need, you need some time to let, you know, you need you need some distance from you and the words that you just that you just wrote. So it's it's a good thing to get away and get some perspective. I think that's you know. uh, great advice. Um, I'm pretty sure we have some writers in the audience, so they're getting some great writing advice from uh, writing professors here on this stream. Um, well, I think that about does it. Um, Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, uh, Maria and Alex for uh, the wonderful conversation. Um, again, we have signed book plates available for LA <laughs> <Yay>! weather. <Yeah. laughs>
Um, so if you would like a signed book plate, Thanks. just make sure to write signed book plate in the order comments when you're checking out uh, your cart. You can access our website by clicking on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. And for those of you who tuned in late, don't worry, a replay of this talk will be available as soon as the broadcast ends. And that about does it. Uh, stay safe, everyone, and have a good night. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for, for listening and for, for attending this, uh, this presentation. And thank you, Romans. Thank you, uh, Rira. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.